Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Ale, and this episode is going to be about Etnia Negra. As you all know, I am Panamanian American. Um, my ancestry comes mainly from Panama, my grandma and my mom's side, um, and her parents fled from Jamaica to Panama um, when my grandma was like small. I don't really know like the intricate detail details of that, but that's like my family origin. And I decided to do this video because I didn't see like any information about Etnia Negra like like publicized I guess and especially not on YouTube there's a very small percentage of Panamanians in the United States I believe it's less than a percent and I'm in Minnesota so I have <laughs> I, I like rarely meet other Panamanians like like I have a flag in my car that's like like on the side and it's like a small Panamanian flag and usually like different Panamanians will be like come up to me and be like oh are you from there and like, stuff like that I'm like oh yeah but you know we out here in the states and they're just like so you know a little solidarity there but before I go into Etnia Negra and um, what it came to be today I'm gonna go into like the history and the culture of Panama to lead up to like um, you know what it stands for today and things like that so Panama achieved its independence from Spain uh, November 28th 1821 and almost immediately its leaders voluntarily annexed the Isthmus to Gran Colombia which is you know uh, it's known as Colombia now uh, also known as the like Nueva Granada and the subsequent separation of Panama from Gran Colombia occurred in 1903, which coincided with the period when the United States began to show um, an interest, like an increasing interest in the Isthmus. And when I say Isthmus, I mean like the the like Caribbean islands. Um, I'll probably like put like a picture right here to show you like what I mean specifically what the area is um pero in uh 1848 the government of gran colombia and the united states um ratified a a treaty that gave the united states the right to intervene on panamanian territory if uh if free transit or uh the sovereignty of gran colombia were in danger so of course they took that to mean like okay we can just say there's danger or whatever and just continue to use the transit system to our own profit which um with the later discovery of gold in california in 1848 the period known as like the gold rush or whatever transportation across the east moves became like a absolutely vital to the United States since it was faster and safer to travel um, to the east coast of the United States uh, across the Isthmus of Panama, known as the Panama Canal now, uh, to get to the west coast. So, uh, you know, like this way across the Isthmus, um, across the Panama Canal, and uh, that's what we know like today. And um, you're noticing that like it's these two different colonizers choosing over or bargaining uh, bargaining this transit system without the input of Panamanian citizens. So that's that's where this starts. Um, I mean, uh, as everything, the colonialism. Oof, that was Harvard. Started this maltreatment of, of Panamanians. Colombia signed a contract with the Panamanian Railroad Company, uh, a U.S. to build the uh, Transmithian Railroad, beginning May 1850. 
um, and its construction was completed uh, 1855. According to most historians, um, the majority of the 5,000 workers employed on the project came from the island of Jamaica. So if you are a historian or have any basic knowledge in history, um, you know that 1850s were not a good time for black people, okay? We were enslaved, we were freshly emancipated, freshly, freshly, and a lot of people didn't even find out um, until two years later after the emancipation. Um, so I believe the emancipation was 1850. I'll put it up if I'm wrong, but it's 1850. Usually people didn't find out until two years later. And um, um, in terms of the, the Panama Canal, labor was hired directly from Jamaica who arrived as free people which caused a lot of discomfort between the Eastmus, uh, the, the enslaved people who were already on or in Panama, the people who were still enslaved, people, uh, black people were coming over in their eyes um, as free people, um, which caused a lot of, um, yeah, it caused a lot of discomfort between, between those two, um, I guess generations of, of black people meeting each other. Um, I'm sure that, that that must have been very jarring to see um, after hundreds of years of, of, of enslavement, um, just some free free niggas coming over on the boat. I don't know, um, but um, uh, later in like 1851, the emancipation movement spread. Um, like throughout Latin America and this this was the year that it was um, abolished slavery was actually abolished in Panama and in 1852 the port of the uh, the port city of Colón which was like the closest city next to the canal was founded um, because all of these people were, were coming, all of these Jamaicans were coming over to, uh, you know, build in Panama. A lot of them were like setting roots in Panama, getting married, having kids and things like that. So they needed a place to live, but, but there was still segregation between the white Panamanians and the uh, black Panamanians, usually separated by, uh, different things that I don't think I'll get into in in this particular um, video because it's it's kind of extensive as is everything with um, colonizers uh, they do a great job of being thorough um, so anyways over 80,000 um, over 80,000 different African people people of African descent lived in this city um and that's when the um the like rail word railway construction like started and stuff so with the law of i um i believe it's like the ninth amendment in panamanian like the constitution thing may 30th of 2000 it was declared in the in Panama uh, each year May 30th um, it's going to be a day of civic engagement and commemoration of all of the people of African descent in Panama and it is held yearly throughout the territory of Panama in order to emphasize the the values further um, like their like African African contribution to the culture and uh, development of the country and it could be it could be anything from it can also be noted that uh, the history of the date like uh, May 30th 
back in 1820, King Ferdinand, whatever, I think like seven of Spain, um, abolished the slave trade law in his territory, which was heavily, heavily influenced by the black people that he owned. Currently, 41% of Panama is of Afro descent and 5% is black. The rest may, is made up of mesticos between mulatos and zambos. And I'll put the definitions for those here, uh, which is clearly seen as, um, you can clearly like see it within the population. Um, like this, this population includes, again, I'll put the map right here, <laughs> is uh, Bogos de Toro, Colón, Darien, uh, Rio Bajo, and... <laughs> I keep trying to like switch between Spanish and English. Uh, uh, Parque Lefebvre? 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 Tell me how to say that in the comments. I tried. Now the main influence, uh, which I'll probably be repeating from now and again, is like Afro descent or Afro Atelan. Afro Atelan, those are the people who originated, like the uh, Native Americans in the United States. Uh, uh, Atelan uh, people originated here, or they were um, they were brought here from the slave trade directly from Africa. Uh, they'll be referred to that way also because um, there's a lot of like mixing in between again people were you know cohabitating and stuff like that so of course that was gonna happen and um, one of the main influences of afro Atelan culture is language Panama is a country where the main language is Spanish but the majority of afro descendants from um, um, from the island are bilingual and because they speak they usually speak English as their second language. Uh, for instance, my grandma, she, um, I believe she worked like in a government position for a little bit. Not like government, government position or anything like that, like important. Um, just like, you know, like a government job or whatever, like desk work stuff, type of stuff. And she was required to like learn English and stuff like that, which heavily influenced like her teaching English to her kids and stuff like that um, and eventually like my mom and stuff like that so um, also like I usually feel more comfortable speaking in English because like a majority of my schooling is in this ha has been in the States even though like I like spent summers uh, in school in Panama um, and like even though like at, at the same time I feel comfortable like reading and writing in Spanish and under, understanding Spanish as it's spoken to me is like pretty I can I can usually I can get the gist of everything that's being said um, it's just like speaking I get I get really nervous I definitely have like stage fright with with uh, when it comes to me speaking in Spanish. Uh, in terms of uh, afro Atlan influence in literature, um, there is a famous journalist, Gaspar Octavio Hernandez, who wrote El, El Cisne Negro. I definitely should have said Negro. But we get it that time. <laughs> as well as uh, literary critic Rodrigo Miro Grimado um, and also Melva Lowell, Lowell, Lowell Goodwin Melva Goodwin we'll call her Melva Goodwin um, she is a retired educator and writer with publications focused in history, culture, and experiences of the black people in Panama. She has many different books written about like, um, like, uh, this one that you'll see me, like, referencing usually. Um, 
luckily my grandpa um, had an English version. Um, uh, and that is my grandpa on my dad's side. He's also Panamanian. Probably should have prefaced that, but you know, it's whichever. I mean, whatever evidence you need that I'm Panamanian, I mean, I think I got a flag somewhere. But, I mean, who's gonna check me? And, and there are other contributions within, um, within, like, a political level or like painters, writers, artists, musicians, doctors, stuff like that. Um, obviously, like, we're influenced by Afro descendants in other ways, but I'm not gonna go into like all that right now. I'm just like gonna go over Enya Negra in its totality. Um, but the traditions and customs have mainly um many have have been the cultural samples in national identity that afro descendants have contributed like both in dances music costume um uh food very heavy food um, as well as like educational and sports fields. Uh, the dances include um, like a really, really diverse <laughs> set of dances that represent like the Afro descendant culture. Among them is the um, El Tombor Africano, Los Congos, La Cumbia. El Purengue, El Punto, and El Calypso. Can I dance all those? Maybe four? I know I know the Congo and El Punto, but I I'll, don't I'll know if I can I don't know if I can sling to the rest. Um, on special occasions or like galas and stuff like that. Both the men and the women wear very eye-catching garments uh, where they were equally wear uh, loose suits with tunics on their heads, especially go to uh, mass or their uh, traditional parades and ceremonies in these garments and things like that. Black women would usually wear the famous uh, ovana or wrap on their heads, which they only knew how, um, which, um, they knew how to design with the techniques that are passed down generationally, basically. So unless you were of Afro descent, you didn't know how to um, properly wrap your head for these dances and things like that. Um, um, and with uh, with Ovana, they covered their whole head or a part of it, and it's traditional to um, wear uh, wear braids in your hair, um, which today is honored in competitions and parades as it wasn't before because uh, similarly in the United States hair was being discriminated against in Panama because of the United States influence as I stated before yada 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 on the other hand in the Dan in the man's typical dances um, the men's garments will range from um, rags or torn clothes and a hat known as the kofi. Um, in addition to this, they uh, they form a character with some painted faces, um, almost like a dragon on the face, um, uh, or some other type of animal like that, like a longer animal. Um, some painted, oops, some painted with faces, and others with masks or. Um, 
uh, or sticks. Now lastly, Panama is very characterized by its rich ass seafood. The entire country of Panama is surrounded by water, um, hence the Isthmus of Panama. Um, but uh, in addition to its use of like spices and condiments that give a particular flavor, the foods include the torrejas de bacalao, one of my favorites, definitely like hands down. It's like this spicy codfish with rice, bitch. That's why I put it first. Cause I gotta, I gotta show y'all this. Like this is. So good, it's so good. It's so good. Anyways, and then there's um, marisco guacho con sofrito and like onions and tomatoes and stuff like that uh it's a it's like really common to use like tomatoes and um yeah tomatoes onions sofrito um sazon in like our dishes um ooh, other i keep hitting my um camera um other ones like other foods that are common are rondon um patacones with uh garlic and like um whole fish with rice uh and when i mean whole fish i mean like the eyeballs and all like eyeballs to the fucking tail like shit is so good um and uh what else what else usually like a lot of the whole fish will be like snappers um, snappers, um, I'm blanking all the, on, on some other ones right now. Oh, bass, um, yeah, it's by the lesson. Yeah, so, like, foods like that, um, obviously a lot of, like, uh, crabs, um, see, a lot of just different seafood, seafood sauces amongst, like, a lot of others. Uh, there's also like, in terms of sweets, there's a lot of um, dishes such as the um, uh, raspao, which can commonly be found in like street vendor corners and things like that. Um, and it's like a iced, creamy, like, fruity flavored like I, I, snow cone snow cone that's what it is um yeah it's like a creamy flavored snow cone with like this sweet milk um and which you pour on top of like the shaved ice and then you um obviously pick out which like flavor you want usually i go with raspberry that's my favorite um and yeah like that's that's it you just like go on your way um, it'll typically be like, I don't know, I don't know right now because like the prices have gone up since I was a kid, but like back in the day it used to be like a few like quarters or whatever, or the equivalent of a few quarters and things like that. Um, uh, along with that, there's like cocoa with cashew seeds, um, uh, different like patties with chocolate in them. Um, something called Johnny Cake, uh, Pen Bon, and other. Okay, that's the end of my video. Thank you for coming and dealing with my wobbly ass camera. Um, if you like this and want to see more, definitely hit that like and subscribe, and I'll see y'all on the next one. Thank <laughs> you.